Welcome to today's Life Group study. Um, as you know, we finished off in the last episode uh, in chapter 13 of the book of Romans. Uh, what a blessing studying that chapter was for me. And uh, today we're going to be moving on and into chapter 14, looking at the entire chapter, verses 1 right through to verses 23. And so what I want you to do right at the start is to uh, pause the video and read through this chapter. And then after you've read through this chapter, just ask two questions. Ask and answer two questions amongst yourselves, discuss amongst yourselves. Uh, these are the questions. What is Paul dealing with here in this passage? And what is the main point he's making? Okay, so what is the subject that Paul is dealing with here in this, this passage? What, are, what is the matter? What are the issues that he's dealing with here in this passage? And what is the main point that he's making in this passage? So once you've read this chapter and you've discussed those two questions, uh, then just come back and we will continue the study. Well, welcome back. Uh, I hope that your discussions were fruitful, that they went well. Let's have a look at these questions. Uh, what is Paul dealing with here in this passage? Well, I think it's clear. He's dealing with what we would call disputable matters. Matters that uh, are about personal convictions and opinions. So when we look at verses 1 and 2, this is what we read there. It, Paul says, Receive the one who is weak in the faith and do not have disputes over differing opinions. So that's what he's discussing. That's the, the subject that he's dealing with, the issues that he's dealing with in this particular chapter is this, this issue of differing opinions, matters about personal convictions and opinions. So these matters are those that have no bearing on one's right standing with God. They have nothing to do with the advancement of the kingdom of God. So we see this in verse 17 where Paul says, For the kingdom of God does not consist of food and drink, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So while these matters are really matters of conscience, matters of personal uh, opinion, they are matters that can cause strife and trouble in the church. And uh, as we see in this passage, they can even result in us destroying the work of God. They can result in us wounding our brothers and sisters in Christ, causing them to stumble. And as a result, in our own condemnation. And so this is why Paul feels that or felt that this was an, such an important matter to address and devote an entire chapter in this letter to. Okay, even though these matters are what we would consider to be gray matters, areas that fall into the gray category. They're not black and white as so many other issues are. Now we'll see that Paul mentions three different things, three different things that fall into this category of disputable matters. He brings them up in this passage. Uh, the first one is, what a person considers he can or cannot eat. And in particular, we see him mention vegetables and meat. Um, the second one is what a person considers he can or cannot drink. And in particular, Paul mentions wine, or we could say um, he, wine represents all alcohol. And then thirdly, we see Paul bringing up this aspect of how a person treats the different days of the week. Um, one treats one day as holier than the rest, whereas another person may treat them as being all the same. So that's really what Paul is discussing. These, this is the matter that he's looking at. These are the, this is the issue that he's really addressing in this chapter. So let's move to the second question. What is the main point that Paul is making? Well, I believe we can sum it up in this. We are not to allow such things to be a cause of strife and contention in the church, or a cause of stumbling and offense uh, for another unbeliever or to another unbeliever. Okay, We're not to allow such things, as Paul is discussing in this chapter, to be a cause of strife and contention in the church or a cause of stumbling and offense to another believer. Now, there are three main points, three major truths, let me put it that way, three major truths that Paul reminds us, us of in this passage. And these are truths that we must constantly bear in mind as we go about life. And they are truths that really um, give us a foundation for uh, um, being able to conduct ourselves properly, even with regards to these kind of matters that Paul is discussing in this chapter. So what are these uh, three major truths that Paul shares in this passage? They're found in verses 4, 
verses 7 to 9 and verses 10 to 13. That's where you'll find them. So what I'd like you to do now is once again, just pause the video and just go through those verses. They're going to come up on your screen, so you'll have them there. And just ask yourself, as you read through these particular verses, identify these three major truths that he's reminding us of in this passage. These truths that we must bear in mind as we go about our Christian lives. So just pause the video now and just discuss this together. Well, welcome back. Um, let's have a look at these three major truths that you've been uh, discussing. Um, the first one is found in verse 4, where Paul says, Who are you to pass judgment on another servant? Before his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So what is the point that Paul is making in this particular statement that we read of in this verse? I believe we could say it, that this is what Paul is saying. We are all Christ's servants. And so as a result, we are not to pass judgment on one another in these kind of matters, but we are to leave each other in the Lord's hands, even though we might have different views on these matters, knowing that the Lord is able to take care of his own. And isn't that a wonderful um, truth that the Lord is able to make uh, us stand? And that applies to each and every single one of us. The Lord is able to keep us from falling He's able to keep us from stumbling. So it's, we, we belong to the Lord. We're His servants. And we're not to transgress into a domain that is not ours by judging Jesus' servants in these kind of matters. Okay, we are to leave them in the hands of the Lord. The Lord can take care of His own. So that's the first uh, fundamentally important truth that we see Paul raise here in this passage. The second one is the fact that Jesus is Lord over every one of us and that all we do, we are to do it to please and serve him. And so this is what we see in verses 7 through to verses 9. And you read those verses where Paul talks about this, the fact that Jesus is the Lord over every one of us and that all we do, we are to do it to please and serve him. And then the third very important truth, major truth that Paul brings up here found in verses 10 to 13 is that we will each of us, all of us, give an account of ourselves to God. And when you read through those verses from verses 10 to 13, you see Paul makes it absolutely clear. Now, if we take all these three truths together, um, if we take the truth that we are Christ's servants and that we are not to pass judgment on one another, but leave each other in the hands of the Lord, the fact that Jesus is Lord over every single one of us and that we are to do what pleases Him, we're to live for Him, and the fact that we are all going to give account of ourselves one day to God. What, what do we come up with if we take those three truths together and we put them together into one uh, paragraph or one sentence? So what I'd like you to do is do that as a life group. Just take these three truths that we've brought up, that, we've, that Paul highlights here, and just summarize them in a couple of sentences um, so that we can read and, and do this in the light of what Paul is trying to teach us in this particular passage. How, and do it in, with the bearing in mind what Paul is dealing with, the subject matter that he's dealing with in this particular passage. So once you've done that, then just come back and we'll continue the study together. Well, welcome back once again. If we take all these three truths together, what is Paul telling us? Well, this is what I have uh, I've written down here. Let me just read it to you. He is telling us that when it comes to such matters of conscience, we are not to concern ourselves with what others are doing. We are only to be concerned with ourselves, knowing that we are the Lord's servants, that we exist to do His will, and that we will each have to give an account of ourselves for how we have done his will. Okay, so that is what I believe if we take it and sum up those three major truths that Paul brings out and places in this chapter, that is really why he puts them there. And this is what he's trying to bring across to us. We're not to judge one another in these matters. What we're to do is we're to be concerned about ourselves. We're to, as the Lord said in Matthew chapter 7, we're to not try and take the speck out of our brother's eye, but we're to make sure there's no log in our own. 
Okay, so in, in a sense, what he's saying to us is first take out that log on your own. First take care of yourself in regard to your relationship with the Lord, your service of his name and of his will, knowing that you will give an account of yourself to the Lord for how you conduct yourself in this regard. Okay, so we see that. Now, the next question that I want to ask is, what are the principles that Paul says must govern our attitude towards these disputable matters? What are the principles that Paul says in this chapter must govern our attitude towards these disputable matters? Um, as I've gone through the chapter, I've come up with five, and I'm going to give you the verses just to make it easier for you to, to, to find them and to know what I'm actually referring to. And, and then it's just a matter of pulling them out from these verses. Uh, the, the verses are verses 1 to 2, verses 3 and 10, verses 13 to 16, verses 14 and 23, and verses 17 to 19. Now they're going to come up on your screen, and the question itself will also come up on the screen, um, so you don't have to get nervous that you're not going to be able to remember them. When you're done, just come back as normal, and we'll continue the study. Well, welcome back. Uh, let's have a look at these principles. I've seen five of them. I've identified five that I would consider to fall into this category of principles that Paul says must govern our attitudes towards these disputable matters. The first one is this, that we need to realize that not everyone is in the same place in their beliefs over these disputable matters. So that th there needs to be a realization of that. And th that's why you see Paul talking about uh, people in church being in different places in their faith. He specifically mentions that there are those with weaker faith and therefore by inference those who have stronger faith. And I need to just point out at this, at this particular time that he's not referring here to faith for salvation. He's not referring to faith for miracles or anything like that. You know, people refer to weak and strong faith in those regards, particularly miracles and that kind of uh, thing all the time in today's uh, in environment. That's not what he's talking about here. What is he talking about? He's talking about the fact that one person's conscience, the one who has a weaker faith, the conscience of that person does not allow him or her to eat all kinds of foods. And, and so that's why we see in verse 2 where Paul says, one person believes in eating everything, but the weak person eats only, in, only vegetables. You see, the weaker person, their faith prohibits them from eating meat. Or we could say this, their conscience prohibits them from eating meat. Whereas the uh, the other person who has the stronger faith, what Paul refers to is that um, his conscience will actually allow him to eat meat, will allow him to eat everything, as Paul says here, where he has no problem with whatever he eats. It doesn't uh, cause him condemnation, whereas the one who has a weaker faith will be condemned if he eats something, let's say, like meat, for example, as Paul is pointing out here. Okay, so that's the first principle that we see here that needs to govern our attitude towards these things. The realization that not everyone is in the same place in their beliefs over these disputable matters. It is really a matter of conscience, what a person's conscience allows or does not allow. The second principle is this, that those who have stronger faith are not to despise those who have weaker faith. And those who have weaker faith are not to judge those who have stronger faith. And so we see Paul uses these two words, despise and judge, several times in this particular chapter. And maybe in your translation, instead of having the word despise, it might be looked down upon or something like that. So we see in verses 3 and 4, Paul says, The one who eats everything must not despise the one who does not, and the one who abstains must not judge the one who eats everything, for God has accepted him. Verse 10, he says, But you who eat vegetables only, why do you judge your brother or sister? And obviously, it's referring to your brother or sister who eats other things apart from vegetables. And then he continues, and you who eat everything, why do you despise or look down on your brother or sister who doesn't eat everything? So uh, we see right there that this is a really um, a, an important point to make, that those whose faith does allow them to, let's say, eat everything, must not look down upon those whose faith does not. And those whose faith does not allow them to eat everything must not judge those whose faith does. So this is important because I'm not sure which category you would fall into. Um, but there might be people in our uh, church. Uh, there might be other Christians that you come into contact with, maybe even from other churches, 
who fall within both of these categories or into a category that is different to yourself. So rather, those with a stronger faith are to receive those with a weaker faith without despising them, to receive them. That's what Paul says. And he says that in verse 1. And those with weaker faith are to realize that God has accepted those with a stronger faith. Okay, so that's a very important principle that we also need to bear in mind to govern our attitude in these particular matters. The third one is this, and I believe this is one of the most important points, uh, one of the most important principles that Paul makes in this chapter. The law of love is to govern what the strong in faith eat and drink. You see, the law of love supersedes our consciences. And notice that this is really addressed to those who are strong in faith. So I'm speaking here to people who are strong in faith. They fall into that category of definition, that category that Paul defines here. Those who are strong in faith need to understand that the law of love supersedes their consciences. What our consciences might allow, the law of love may not. So while it, it's not sinful to eat or drink, what our consciences permit us to eat or drink, it is sinful to do so if it will harm a brother or sister. This is so important. I want to just say that again. While it's not sinful for us to eat or drink, what our consciences permit us to eat and drink, it is sinful to do so if it will harm another brother or sister. Look at verses 13 and 14. Uh, Paul says, Therefore, uh, we must not pass judgment on one another, but rather determine never to place an obstacle or a trap before a brother or sister. So we must determine that we'll never do that. Then verse 14, he says, I know him and convinced in the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean in itself. So he's not, this, this has got nothing to do with whether food and, and drink in, of itself is wrong. He says, still it is unclean to the one who considers it unclean. Verse 15, for if your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy by your food someone for whom Christ has died. And verse 16, therefore do not let what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. So the law of love is to govern what the strong in faith eat and drink. We are not to eat and drink anything that will cause harm to another brother or sister. And I think we could even extend that to any other person, even within our community, that we are trying to bear witness to. Um, so, and and we, we'll see that when at the end of this particular study, I ask you to read 1 Corinthians 8 and 9. You'll see how it also applies there to even people that are outside the church. Okay, so the law of love is very important and it is the highest authority when it comes to these matters. We have to walk in love, which means that our consciences, even if they permit something, may not uh, tell us or give us permission to do it if we are not walking in love in doing so. The fourth principle is this, the consciences of the weak. So this is now directed towards the weak. The last one was towards the strong. This is towards the weak. The consciences of the weak are to govern what they eat and drink. And I suppose as the, the strong also should bear this in mind, um, they should take this to heart. So remember what I'm talking about when I talk about strong and weak. The strong are those whose consciences permit them to eat and drink anything whereas the weak are those whose consciences don't. Look at verses 14 and 15. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean in, in itself. Still, it is, it is unclean to the one who considers it unclean. Okay, do you see that? It is unclean to the one who considers it unclean. So if somebody considers something to be wrong to eat or drink and they go ahead and do it, do you realize that they are defiling themselves? They're defiling their conscience. Look at verse 23. But the man who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not do so from faith. And whatever is not from faith is sin. That is a very, very powerful uh, statement that Paul makes at the end of this chapter. So if somebody eats something when his conscience is condemning him and not allowing him to do so, he's not eating from faith. You cannot go against your conscience and do something in good faith. So Paul says this, even though the actual eating of the food and the, eat, the drinking of that drink that the person's conscience does not permit is not in itself a sin, it becomes a sin because he violates his conscience. He's doing something that does not come from faith. He's doing it with doubt in his heart because of what his conscience is telling him. And so when somebody does that, it becomes sin. And so this also we need to bear in mind for those of us who are strong in faith, what Paul describes as strong in faith here. Yeah. 
we need to also bear in mind that we should never be forcing someone to eat or drink anything that's against their conscience because in doing so we're actually causing them to defile their conscience and bring themselves under condemnation and they actually do that which is sinful it becomes sinful for them to do that and we don't want to cause somebody to stumble now in the the fifth one the fifth uh, principle is in all we do we are to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Let me just read verses 17 to 19. For the kingdom of God does not consist of food and drink, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For the one who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by people. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for building up one another. So that's the fifth principle. Everything that we do, we must do it to, to, uh, with a desire to have peace and mutual edification. Now, let's consider these principles in the context of our own lives. We've looked at them sort of as they are presented here in this chapter, but uh, let's consider these principles in the context of our own lives. In other words, in the context of the types of food we eat, um, might we be destroying or putting a stumbling block in the path of somebody else by what we allow ourselves to eat? Now, that may not be necessarily the case in the church or maybe in your life group, but maybe it, it might become relevant when we consider the fact that we come into contact uh, with other people of different faiths. Um, and obviously, if that person is okay with us eating or drinking something, um, then that's not an issue. So we're talking here particularly about how do we apply this whole thing of putting a stumbling block in the path of somebody um, in, in what we eat. So it may not be a, rele a, a very relevant thing to us, maybe certainly not as relevant to us maybe as it was back then. Um, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 8, as I'm going to ask you to do, um, then you might also get a, a bit of a better insight into what I'm talking about here in that particular point. Um, so let's consider these principles in the context of the types of food that we eat. How do we apply it to our lives in that context? Also in the context of the kind of drinks we take. And I think obviously this is particularly to do with us uh, partaking in alcohol. Um, and we need to ask ourselves, is our freedom, if we're strong and we do partake in alcohol, is our freedom to partake obviously moderately in alcohol, uh, with self-control, not getting drunk because the Bible clearly says that drunkenness is a works of darkness, a work of darkness. Um, if our freedom to take a drink, to take a glass of wine with a meal, uh, is that freedom causing somebody else to stumble? And I think we can uh, just think about how that might uh, work out in our everyday lives, you know, how we might in uh, partaking in alcohol cause offense or stumbling to somebody else. Maybe you can just discuss that and how that could take place. And then the third thing is in the context of, let's say, the Sabbath or holy days, the Lord's Day. Um, just think through these things and um, just discuss them and, and ask yourselves as you do this discussion, are, is my freedom in any way causing stumbling blocks, laying stumbling blocks, uh, bringing offense, maybe leading someone to destruction, to stumble um, by, by my exercising of it? So once you've just discussed that as a group and uh, really try to just apply the truths that we're learning here. That's really what you're trying to do, is to apply the truths that we're learning today to our lives. Uh, once you've done that, just come back and we'll wrap the study up. Welcome back. Um, I just want to remind you as we close off the study and uh, just to remind you of how Paul throughout Romans chapter 12, chapter 13 and chapter 14 has kept on bringing up the subject of love. You know, as Christians, love is to govern every aspect of our lives. And we see it again in this chapter that we've been studying tonight. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 14, he said, let all that you do be done in love. And this needs to be the governing principle. We need to do what is good for others. We need to bear others' interests in our hearts and minds as we go about our, love, our lives. If we love our neighbors and therefore we live our lives with their good and their best interests in mind, and by our neighbors, that, that's any other person that we come into contact with in our daily lives. Um, if we love them and we're living our lives with their good and their best interests in mind, uh, even if it means we must make some sacrifices along the way, we're willing to do that. We will be living lives that are pleasing to God and we will gain his commendation on the judgment day. And so that's so important for us just to uh, 
uh, keep in mind as, as we wrap this up today. I want to just leave you with a bit of homework. Uh, it would be wonderful if you could all just read, and this you can do in your own time, uh, before the next episode, just read 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9. There Paul is actually addressing the same issues. He's doing it in a slightly different way. Um, and so I think it will just give us a, a greater insight into what Paul is actually communicating here in Romans chapter 14 by just seeing what he communicated to the Corinthian believers about these same kind of matters and just the, the different way that he communicated it to that particular group of Christians. It might just help us to actually gain a, a more full and complete understanding of what Paul has been sharing with us in this chapter. It's been wonderful to be with you and I look forward to the next time that we'll be together. Uh, what a blessing it is to be able to study the scriptures together and how rich this kind of study will make us. God bless you.